Hello, everyone, and welcome to Korean Cinema Today, the Korean Film Council's podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Pierce Connor in Seoul, and today I'll be taking you through the world of contemporary Korean film. Korean Cinema Today is the new podcast of Kobiz, which is the online portion of the Korean Film Council. Uh, the website, which is koreanfilm.or.kr, features uh, lots of news and features and interviews on Korean film. Uh, if you visit our website, you will also find the webzine Korean Cinema Today. Uh, you can subscribe to our newsletter and, of course, tune in again to this podcast. Alternatively, on iTunes, you can find it as well by putting in the search term Korean Cinema Today. Find us also on social media. We're very active on both Twitter and Facebook. Our Twitter handle is Korean Film Biz, that's B-I-Z. And on Facebook, you will find us at facebook.com forward slash kobiz.kofik. That's K-O-B-I-Z dot K-O-F-I-C. I'm Pierce Conran, a journalist for the Korean Film Council, as well as the Korean correspondent for the website twitchfilm.com and the editor of Korean film blog modernkoreancinema.com. Today we have once again the great pleasure of uh, having Darcy Packett in the studio with us, a noted Korean film expert and the founder of koreanfilm.org. Thanks so much for joining us again today. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, today we're going to be talking about a new initiative, uh, a new project of, of Darcy's, an awards, uh, an, an awards event, and we're talking a little bit about the state of independent cinema in Korean cinema today. But first, we're going to have a quick look at uh, a bit of news and box office. Lee debut film, Han Gongju, uh, has been very, very popular on the festival circuit recently. It debuted at Busan in October, where it won two awards, the Citizens Reviewers Award and the NetPak Prize, I believe. And uh, after that, it was had its international premiere in Marrakesh, where uh, it was... Uh, awarded the Golden Star, the top prize of the festival, by a jury which was headed actually by Martin Scorsese, uh, who is actually quite well known as a fan of Korean film. Um, and then next, it uh, screened at the Palm Springs International Film Festival and most recently in Rotterdam. In Rotterdam, it uh, won another big prize, the Tiger Award. Um, so, Darcy, are you surprised at all by this film's success? Uh, I mean, I guess I would say that I am. Um as you know, I'm I'm not a big fan of the film. <laughs> and, I mean, my opinion of the film is not going to change regardless of how many festival <laughs> awards it gets. Of course. Um, but, yeah, I think that, um, I mean, certainly this is a film that I had a very strong reaction to it. And my strong reaction was perhaps a, an indication of the fact that, that this film does have very strong qualities. And, mm. I mean, the acting in this film is really very, very good. And I... Uh, I have nothing but but praise for the actors, um, and but it is a film that's dividing people. And apparently, when it was screened in Pusan, and um, yeah, it, among the like the citizens' um, audience jury, I forget the exact name for the jury. I yeah. guess that citizen reviewers kind of yeah, award. That's what it's called. Yeah, yeah, it did win that award in Pusan, mm-hmm. but uh, but apparently there was a heated discussion that led up to the award. I can imagine there was. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's certainly a very polarizing film, uh, polarizing to the point where we're on separate sides of the fence right here. <laughs> um, I, was a, I was a huge fan of the film, and uh, the film really floored me in Busan. But at the same time, I completely understand people that have the, the opposite reaction. Mm-hmm. I think where m- mostly people will agree that the performances are very strong, that the kind of the, the film style, this is a debut film, is, is quite strong. Um, but then the the kind of the central crux of the film, which is a, a very kind of a shocking and upsetting scene, which uh, to kind of explain it in great detail would probably spoil the movie. But um, this uh, this kind of central element of the film, which uh, it kind of builds up to in a sense, but doesn't exactly um, tell you what's going to happen beforehand. Um, th- Everyone gets uh, is getting a strong reaction to that to to that scene um, mm-hmm. or a series of scenes, but uh, for some people it's uh, it's upsetting for everyone. But for some people it's uh, it's kind of a good thing uh, in terms of I mean they found it very powerful. I did, and I thought it was uh, very very good. But at the same time, other people are finding it's kind of perhaps somewhat manipulative and uh, just just too too upsetting, um, uh, which I, I believe is where, where where you fall on it. Yeah, and I think I mean for me actually it was it was beyond that particular scene, and I think that f- 
Uh, I mean, films have this tremendous power to either, I mean, affect the viewer's emotions. And I think that, I mean, for me, and I think for other people who I've talked to, who who felt in similar ways to me, uh, it was a question of like how the film chose to use this power, um, you know, to affect the viewer. And, you know, the decisions in terms of using um, the different elements of the film to create a certain effect. Uh, and so, I mean, I had some issues, even, to be honest, I mean, for the first 60 or 70 percent of the film, I I loved the film. I was I was very happy up until um, up to that point in the film. But even at that point, I was there was something that was making me feel a little bit uneasy about the way that the film was pulling me in. And ultimately, what the film did with my emotions, I made me somewhat angry. And, and so that those are my primary issues with the film. And I think that Again, if if this were a film that were made by a director with no talent, or you know, then nobody would be having such strong reactions to it. And so I think that uh, this is a very talented director, um, but I but I did react that way. Sure, uh, I see what you mean about the way it kind of pulls you in. It's very it's very clever the way it's structured, actually, and uh, it kind of it does kind of draw you in a certain way. It's kind of kind of, can I say kind of lulls you in, mm-hmm. and it kind of surprises you, kind of grips you at a certain point. And uh, so I guess that can that can kind of make you react, you know, either of two ways. Um, so anyway, the film won the Tiger Award uh, in Rotterdam, which is kind of the top prize in Rotterdam. Uh, every film three year, um, sorry, every year three films are awarded this prize. It's for um, uh, first or second features, similar to the New Currents Award in Busan. This is the fifth time that a Korean film has won that award, the first being Hong Sang-soo's debut, The Day a Pig Fell into the Well, uh, a 1996 film that won the award in 1997. The next being uh, Pak chan uh, not to be confused with Pak chan uh, Pak chan Jealousy is My Middle Name, uh, her debut from 2002. And then Yang Yik Jun's Breathless from 2008, and most recently before Han Gong Ju, Pak Chong Bom's uh, very well received debut, The Journals of Musan. Um, so Korean films very popular in Rotterdam over the years. Uh, yeah, I mean it's um, Rotterdam's been a great festival for Korean cinema, and they've um, they've both you know premiered a lot of interesting Korean films, and and often. Uh, taken films that were introduced at the Busan Film Festival in the fall, and then kind of given them this additional showcase, uh, you know, in January. Uh, and if I remember correctly, Paju was also one of the opening films at that's correct, yeah, at Rotterdam. And so, yeah, I mean, certainly, I think that uh, people who are able to attend Rotterdam um, can get a pretty good glimpse of what's new and exciting about Korean independent film. Yeah, it's definitely been a, a good platform for Korean film over the years. Uh, we don't see so many films in Sundance, although uh, Jisoo will famously won its the grand prize last year. Um, and then, of course, Berlin. We do, we have quite a few other uh, Korean films there, so it's a pretty strong presence at the in, in the the early part of the festival calendar. Uh, moving on to some box office news, um, the Korean Film Council released its report for the year, and uh, I'm sure everyone knows about the big year that Korean film has had. But perhaps what they didn't know was the uh, the foreign sales uh, figures. Uh, now, these figures are nowhere near as high as they were perhaps 10 years ago, uh, but uh, there was an uptick this year of uh, just over uh, or almost 100 percent. Thirty-seven million dollars um, worth of sales were recorded for Korean films. Um, however, half of that was for Bong Joon-ho's Snowpiercer. So, um, it's uh, what, what would you make of that statistic regarding uh, in light of that? Yeah, I mean the statistics for export dollars is uh, something that it's it's hard to kind of piece out the trends from these statistics mm-hmm. because, I mean, as you mentioned, one big film can really affect. Uh, an individual year's totals. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, Snowpiercer is a very new kind of film for Korea, and it's it's very significant. And the fact that it uh, this is a big international film with an international cast that was made in Korea with Korean financing and then sold around the world, uh, I think this is kind of a the way forward for Korean film exports in a way, or at least an important new uh, initiative. Um, I mean, you mentioned 10 years ago, in the mid-2000s, there was this boom in Korean film exports when a lot of films were being sold to Japan. Mm -hmm. And this was fueled in part by enthusiasm over Korean stars. I mean, that boom 
proved to last a few years and then it fell off rather quickly. Uh, and so this, it was sort of a burst bubble that um, ultimately had sort of a, a negative effect on the film industry. Mm. But, uh, but in this case, I think that, um, yeah, I think we can see it as a positive sign. And um, I'm not sure what the next Snowpiercer will be, but um, but it seems that the Korean film industry now has the potential to make these kind of films. Oh, definitely. And uh, I mean, some companies like CJ in particular, making a lot of big co-productions with uh, China and other countries. So we're, we're seeing some potential there. Um, I mean, the, to, to put this figure in perspective, though, um, in 2013, the total sales figures uh, for at, at cinemas were something like one point. One point seven, one point eight uh, billion dollars. Mm, yes, <laughs> um, and of that, you know, that's sixty percent was Korean. So we're looking at you know maybe one point one billion. So putting you know besides like you know forty million for foreign exports, it's it's really kind of a drop in the bucket. It is, and it always has been. I mean, even at its peak, uh, I think that uh, I mean Korean film exports were not making up a significant percentage of the industry's overall revenues. Uh, but for certain films, I think it is a really big part of it. And mm-hmm. so for Snowpiercer, uh, I mean, they made back half their budget, at least, with international sales. And um, and so for the right kind of project, I think exports can be really important. Um, but as a whole, certainly Korea is much more focused on its home market. Absolutely. So this is more kind of a, a case-by-case thing where yeah. the exports can, can play a large role. Um, uh, other ancillary markets uh, are making up a little bit more money for the industry, uh, including the big things are IPTV, which is kind of the Korean version of on-demand television, and um, uh, online uh, online streaming. Mm. Uh, those uh, those were up 18 and 24% respectively. Uh, I don't actually have the figures right beside me, but I, I believe they're close to two Hundred million, so that is, that is, uh, that is a bit more than just a, bu- a drop in the bucket there. Yeah, and this is an exciting development too because um, it is new. I think that five, ten years ago, a lot of people were worried about the fact that uh, a film's theatrical release accounted for so much of its earnings, and that you know there was very limited DVD market in Korea, and yeah. uh, and that's dangerous because if you know if you make a film, but then you're not able to secure a lot of screens. Uh, maybe you're not working with a big distributor that has a lot of power. Uh, then your film can get lost. Whereas these days, uh, there is a bit more of a second chance if your uh, film has good word of mouth and people can rediscover it later and kind of watch it uh, at home. And yeah, and so broadly, I think this is a really positive development for the film industry. Absolutely. As you mentioned, yeah, there is pretty much no DVD market in Korea. Uh, certainly even a non-existent Blu-ray one as well. Mm. Uh, but I mean, perhaps this is kind of the way of the, the, way of the world, but in Korea, just, uh, just a bit more. Um, one last statistic is that uh, the return on investment for the 63 um, wide releases, uh, 60, 63 wide release Korean films last year, the ROI was uh, 15.2%, which, was, uh, which is much stronger than it's been uh, in Korea. You know, for a while, um, it was I think it was around thirteen percent last year, but for many years it was uh, it was actually negative. Um, so this is uh, something I'm sure that people have been breathing a sigh of relief. They're actually films are making money again. <laughs> I know. I mean, this is something that, as far as I know, I don't I don't know of other film industries that release this statistic and that try to figure out an overall return on investment in films. Uh, but I have a feeling if you did it for almost any other film industry, <laughs> that every year it would be a very steep loss. That I mean, filmmaking is a is a gamble in many ways. And if you get a big hit, then you can make back your losses. Mm. Uh, But the fact that, I mean, the film industry as a whole turned to 15% profit is kind of unbelievable. That's that's pretty big. Uh, I mean, with these figures, of course, there's perhaps a lot of qualifying factors and there's different kind of revenue streams and it's hard to know exactly what that means. But uh, certainly there's been a big upswing in recent recent years and the industry is kind of uh, definitely doing very well. Yeah, other film industries are jealous, I'm sure. Yeah. (laughs) Um, uh, yeah, so then, yeah, a big year for Korean film, not just with the local box office, but also with ancillary markets, exports were up a little bit, and overall, the return on investment has seen a very healthy uptick. So, Darcy, you, uh, are very busy, of course, in the Korean film industry. You wear many hats. 
uh, as well as you, you write a lot about Korean film. You're a professor on Korean cinema, um, and you consult for various film festivals. Uh, but uh, it seems that you're working on a new project. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, this is it's related to the fact that uh, in the past few years, the film industry is sort of divided up into two different parts, you might say, <laughs> that, um, I mean, the mainstream commercial industry is doing very well. Uh, at the same time, there are more and more independent films, low-budget films being made um, and and being released in theaters, but not you know, getting nearly as much attention as the big ones, obviously. Uh, and it's there's not so much of a middle ground. There is really kind of a division in some ways between films that are shot at a very low budget, uh, films that, you know, if they attract 10,000 or 20,000 viewers, it's considered to be a, a pretty strong success. Uh, you know, and these big commercial films, which are aiming for millions of viewers. And, you know, more broadly, it, it just seemed to me that independent films, low-budget films, were not getting... Uh, I mean, everybody knows that they're not getting as much attention as they deserve, but uh, since they were becoming just a bigger and bigger part of the industry... Um, I mean, a number of years ago, I wrote an article, just a column in Cine 21, about the fact that we should establish some kind of award ceremony to recognize the other Korean film industry, the one that uh, maybe occasionally will get uh, a nomination here or there and, mm -hmm. you know, the big, the Grand Bell Awards or the other awards, but uh, usually is somewhat ignored at the uh, in all of these end-of-the-year award ceremonies. And Korea has many award ceremonies, but but Indeed. they're pretty much all focused on the big films. And so I was arguing that somebody should go out and make a <laughs> award ceremony, you know, to recognize the achievements of these uh, independent films, low-budget films. Um, and nobody did. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I mean, basically, it, the idea has been in my head for a number of years, and so I decided this year to try to, to put something together. And it's a very modest effort. It will not certainly compete with the Grand Bell Awards in terms of, <laughs> you know, the attention that it, it raises. But I think that um, I see this as kind of a grassroots movement in a way to support independent cinema. And so we're starting this year by recognizing a certain number of independent films. Um, and we hope to grow more and more in the future. So then, this is uh, this will be the the first edition of the uh, of the, the Wildflower Awards. Yes. Um, so, uh, as you mentioned, yeah, there's a, a lot of awards shows take place every year. The the, the Grand Bell Awards, the Blue Dragon Awards, uh, the 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 Pixong Awards, uh, and a number of uh, film critics uh, circles doing their 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 groups as well. So then there's uh, there's definitely this this kind of gap for for independent films. And um, uh, do, do you th what can this exposure uh, how can this exposure benefit independent mm. films? Do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think that. I mean, it goes back to the whole point of giving awards. And I mean, to be honest, I'm not someone who <laughs> takes a great interest in the Oscars or, or even the Grand Bell Awards or those type of things. Um, but I think that, um, I mean, award ceremonies like this are important because they, uh, in one sense, because they're historical, because they, you know, they take place over a number of years and you can look back and see um, how the industry chose to recognize, you know, the films that it produced. Uh, it helps a lot with publicity, and I think that, um, you know, in presenting these awards, also it makes, it reminds people of um, that these films were made and that um, of the particular strengths of these different films or the, the acting performances or the other, uh, you know, all the other people who were involved in making the films. Uh, and so they can play a big role in publicity. Uh, there's, of course, a lot of star power associated with the big award ceremonies, but also even smaller ones. Um, you know, a lot of well-known stars appear in in very small independent films. Um, and more broadly, I think that, um, I mean, I'm hoping that with this award ceremony, um, it goes beyond simply choosing awards and, and presenting awards. I think that uh, throughout the year, uh, we're bringing together a group of people who are going to be watching a lot of independent films and discussing them online and uh, trying to help promote them and spread awareness of the films. And, you know, at the end of the year, the, the process of giving awards, it, it provides some encouragement to the the people who made the the films. But, but I think even more than that, it's just kind of trying to spread awareness about these films that are made outside of the mainstream system, but uh, deserve more attention than they're getting right now. Mm. So um, 
as a as a historical record you mentioned, uh, a festival needs to kind of be around for a while to kind mm-hmm. of create this this kind of this this body of re- recognition yeah. over the years. So then you 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 hope that this uh, this event will 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 kind of endure for a while. I, mean, I do. I, um, I certainly <laughs> don't. Um, yeah, I mean, I hope first of all that the that it does have a long history and that we continue doing this year after year. Um, and and ideally in the future, you know, we'll be able to kind of expand the activities and kind of make it a, um, you know, an event with a big ceremony and maybe attract a bit more media attention than it will this year. Um, but yeah, I, and I think that's important because um, another aspect of these, of what we're doing is um, we're not only keeping a website which, you know, has information about the nominated films and the winning films, but uh, we plan to to publish a book each year which will focus on the winning films and maybe have interviews with the the actors and actresses who were recognized and, um, you know, some other essays about the, the films. And and so we hope to have a series of books eventually that will also be something that you can look back on and mm-hmm. it will be a way that you can discover films from the past that you maybe weren't aware of. Well, that sounds like a, uh, an, a terrific resource for anyone who would be interested in kind of discovering what uh, Korean cinema has to offer in the independent realm. Um, now, speaking of these independent films, uh, a big issue that's kind of people touch on uh, now and again um, is this uh, problem of exposure for Korean films in local theaters. Uh, Korea, of course, has a vertically integrated system, uh, which means that some companies uh, act as studios who produce films as well as distributors and exhibitors. So they have uh, that kind of full chain. Uh, now, this 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 kind of thing happened in America as well, but under the production code, that was abolished some 80 years ago. Um, but this uh, this persists in Korean cinema today and means that uh, booking can sometimes be, to put it mildly, unfavorable for uh, independent films. Um, what measures do you think can be taken to, uh, to to change that in today's today's marketplace? Yeah, I think there are two big issues with this. and One of them is access and just making it easier for ordinary viewers to... Um, to watch these films. And, you know, sometimes even when a film kind of breaks out, an independent film breaks out, and people hear about it and they become curious about it, uh, you know, if they wander into their local multiplex and it's not there, then they're not likely to see it. And it's only the really motivated viewers who who know where to go (laughs) and know where to look to find these films that actually seek them out. Um, And so access is a big part of it, and that's it's related to distribution and um, I know that, I mean, there are independent theaters in Korea that um, that do screen a lot of independent films. And and so the situation is at least better than in some countries where um, a lot of low-budget independent films just aren't given a commercial release. And so, you know, I mean, many Korean independent films are released in theaters each mm-hmm. year. Uh, we had, you know, 20 documentaries released in 2013 and, you know, and Depending on how you define, you know, independent film, you had you know like sixty feature films. Um, but but the other main issue is motivating people to go to see them, and I think that this is a bigger challenge in a way because um, you know it's one thing to make the movies available, and it's another thing to encourage ordinary people to to go out and see them. Mm-hmm. And I mean that's an uphill battle because um, you can't spend a lot of money marketing independent films. It has to be kind of more of a grassroots effort. And that's another reason why I kind of see these awards as a grassroots effort. And I'm trying to encourage people to kind of join in and participate. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, groups like this, I think, um, if you're you're watching films by yourself, then you may not end up watching that much. But uh, if you become part of a community that is interested in a certain, um, you know, in documentaries or in independent films, then you're more likely to keep up with what's coming out and what's new and maybe to watch more films in general. Absolutely. Uh, and this idea of kind of having these kind of uh, this online presence seems uh, particularly useful in Korea, a country that is, uh, is, is hyper-connected. I mean, mm. Something like 95% of uh, the country has a, has a very high-speed Wi-Fi connection. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, uh, so 
going on to film festivals, a lot of film festivals in Korea, they're quite well attended. You know, the main ones being, of course, Busan, Jeonju, and Pifan. Uh, I myself go to a lot of these festivals. I see a lot of independent films at these festivals. And uh, sometimes I have the opportunity to see these independent films uh, by other means, be they press screenings and other things like that. However, I'm ashamed to say I actually rarely visit uh, art house theaters mm-hmm. in, in, in Korea. I end up, mostly, I end, I end up at, uh, at, a, at a local CGV or something. Yeah. Um, so uh, do, do you think art house theaters are, are struggling in Korea? I mean, certainly it's, it's a difficult situation. And... <laughs> I mean, the the Korean Film Council is doing um, a number of different support programs to to help encourage theaters to screen more independent films or to to focus on independent films. Um, I mean, there's Indie Space is one example near Kwangamun. This is a um, a theater that screens more or less only Korean independent films, and so it's a great place where you can go to see uh, these smaller works that aren't being screened at the multiplexes. Uh, usually when I go, it's a fairly sparse crowd, uh, but not always. I think that, you know, occasionally there's a documentary or a feature film like Jisul from last year that that hits a nerve and that people start talking about. And uh, and so in those cases, you know, when you go to the theater, then it is fairly full. Um, and also these theaters, also Indie Plus, which is directly more directly supported by COFIC. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there are other theaters like the at the Art Sanjay Center, they have the, uh, their own theater in the basement there. And a lot of the screenings have visits from the directors. They are very active in organizing these guest visits. Mm. Particularly uh, those, uh, the, the two ones, the KU Cinema Trap, and yeah. uh, the other one is the... Yeah, and then the Gungmin University has one as well. Uh, yeah, and uh, so I, I recall that they have quite a few, quite a few guest visits. Yeah, and that's, it's another good opportunity to, you know, to give audiences more information about the film, uh, if you can go and um, hear the, you know, answer questions to the director afterwards and, and hear more about the film in detail, then that uh, kind of pulls you more into the film and makes it more interesting. And so, um, and so, yeah, they're doing good work. I think um, it's just, um, yeah, I think it, it's a long process, and that creating an audience for independent films is something that you can't just do by spending money. You have to really kind of go out and try to get viewer by viewer, and it, it's a, a process that will take some time. Absolutely, and hopefully part of that process will be uh, uh, the Wildflower Awards. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you've been through your uh, selection and nomination process. Yes. So what are some of the films that you're most excited to see in the final roundup? Um, well, we have a... I mean, the films that are nominated for the main prize, uh, I mean, these are some of the biggest... Um, independent films from the last year. I mean, some of them have been well recognized at other international film festivals. They've received awards. Uh, others, not so much. Others receive more attention in Korea than they have internationally. Uh, Jisoo is one example of a you know very <laughs> highly praised film that um, that I was not surprised to see get into the final seven nominations mm-hmm. for best film. That's definitely one that, that that's played well both overseas and here. Yeah. Uh, the Fake is another one. Mm-hmm. Uh, Fatal, a very impressive debut work. Definitely. Uh, Pluto is another film that uh, it's a, in some ways, an, you know, a festival film, an arthouse film, but also one that speaks to Korean high school students about mm-hmm. their frustrations uh, in, you know, in attending Korean high school, the very competitive environment. And so that's another one among the list. Uh Ingtugi is an interesting one. It's kind of a bit more, uh, you might say, a bit more mainstream in its orientation. It's um, uh, it's by a young director. It was um, and it focuses on this kind of phenomenon related to the internet and um, people kind of meeting outside uh, in person and having these conflicts, these physical conflicts after you know getting embroiled in these internet conflicts online. Um, and so I was surprised to see the support for that among mm-hmm. our, you know, our group of, uh, I mean, the nominations are chosen by, you might say, like an audience jury. That's people who are uh, not necessarily people working in the film industry, but regular viewers of independent films. And we were watching films throughout the year. And, and so this is one that got a lot of support. Mm. But that's uh, actually a graduate project from the Korean Academy of Film Arts. That's right. And so CJ is representing it. Uh, they they have this relationship with the Korean Academy of Film Arts, 
uh, where they they represent the the films from their graduates. Um, but it's yeah, I was happy to see it get some support. It's great to see one getting recognized. They've been making some great films over the last few years. Yeah, um, and then the the documentary category was another one where there are a lot of um, just a lot of diversity in it this year. I think um, some of yeah, I mean Nora No was a it's a documentary about one of Korea's or the first fashion designer from Korea uh, who became active in the 1950s and 1960s and uh, who's named Nora No, and she herself is a really fascinating character and. Uh, so that was a film that, I mean, I was a little disappointed that it didn't sell more tickets when it came out because mm. I think that certainly when people watch it, they, you know, it's a very entertaining film. It's, it's a very, very educational film. You know, fashion is big in Korea these days, and so I, I thought it would do better than it than it actually did. Um, but yeah, it it certainly did get among our our final nominees for best documentary. Um, Jung Lu's film Scenery was another. Uh, that was originally screened in Chunju as a, a shorter work, uh, commissioned by them, and then was uh, later released as a longer feature. Uh, City Hall, another film that um, I really enjoyed. It's about the whole process of constructing the new Seoul City Hall uh, by director Jung jae who uh, this is her second documentary on Korean architecture, uh, the first one being Talking Architect. Uh, which took a completely different approach. It was more focused on one particular architect, uh, whereas City Hall, it looks at the process and the bureaucracy and the uh, the creative process, everything behind you know, the construction of this building. Um, and I mean, I could <laughs> just sort of go on and on about these films because you know, we have nine different categories. There's you know, best film, best documentary, best actor, best actress, mm-hmm. best new actor or actress. Uh, best new director. We have a best cinematography category. Um, in that case, there are three nominees. Mm-hmm. Um, it was Jiso and no surprise P- there. <laughs> yeah, Pluto <laughs> and Russian novel. Oh, okay. Uh, but there's also very strong support for documentaries in the cinematography category. Yeah, and I so, know. So the scenery was a very well shot documentary. Yeah, and Cheju Prayer is another one that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that it. It really got much exposure abroad at all, but no, I don't think so. Um, Just played at Jeonju. Yeah, but it's a beautifully shot documentary and a really interesting pairing to Jisoo, actually, because it's a documentary that um, features kind of people's recollections of that massacre that mm-hmm. that formed the subject of Jisoo, uh, but it approaches it from a very different angle. Obviously, it certainly does. Um, so, um, among all these nominees, uh, was there anything that's, that you were surprised to see in the final lineup? Yeah, I mean, there were a couple pleasant surprises. Um, one of them is that um, among the Best Actor nominees, uh, one of the actors who received the strongest support was Ijun, the popular singer who made his debut in the movie Rough Play. Mm-hmm. Um, Rough Play was you know, shot at a bigger budget than most of our nominees, but it was still kind of within the category of, of low budget. Mm, so produced by Kim ki Yes. Yeah. And, yeah, and he just, um, he impressed a lot of people with his acting skills. He Usually when we see, you know, these popular singers appearing in films, we we assume that they're being put there for their marketing value. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, he uh, did impress people with his acting skills. Um, among the the best new director nominees is uh, Kim Ju Hwan, the director of Koala, uh, which is a, a really nice film that, I mean, I had this experience that I think a number of other people had where uh, I'd heard very little bit about this film. I watched it and was very charmed by it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a film about some people who start up a, a business selling hamburgers uh, after their other dreams in life sort of fall through. Uh, it's just about their struggle of being successful in the hamburger business. Uh, and so it's not blockbuster material. <laughs> it's not something that you could really market in a mainstream way, but it's, um, but yeah, it, the performances are really nice and just the film as a whole, it's, uh, it's really charming. And, um, and I was happy to see other people respond to it in the same way. And mm-hmm. so it, it got a lot of support. It, it missed out on the best film category, but by, by not too much actually, really? but, 
Um, but it is within the uh, Best New Director nominees. I'm very glad to see it there. I was uh, I was also a big fan of the film. Yeah, mm-hmm. very uh, very quaint, but yeah, absolutely charming. Yeah. And of course, uh, what prompted me to see it was uh, was your very positive tweet about it after oh, seeing yes. it at the <laughs> Seoul Independent Film Festival back in 2012. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for pointing in the right <laughs> direction. Um, so uh, h- how do you hope the Wildflower Awards are going to evolve over the years? Uh, well, we're going to continue doing it. We hope to get more people involved. And, I mean, through the website, we'll be seeking more kind of volunteers and participants. Um, next year, I hope to to raise more money and to have kind of a, I'm not sure if you'd call it a glitzy ceremony, but, um, but yeah, a proper ceremony where we uh, are able to invite all the nominees and to present them with awards. And, and I'd really like to provide cash prizes in the future. Um, in the first year... It wasn't possible, but I we felt that it was important to start and to have the first uh, edition and then to go ahead with expanding it in future years. And so, um, yeah, we're going to try our hardest and just make it as meaningful and, um, yeah, a, an event that attracts a lot of attention. Um, we'll, we'll do our best to ensure that that happens. Well, uh, best of luck with the event. I'm very excited to to see it develop over the years and mm-hmm. to, to see who will be uh, who will be triumphant uh, when the winners are announced. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah. So, thank you very much for joining us again and for giving us the the, the lowdown on this new award ceremony and a bit about the the independent film scene in Korea. So, thanks again for joining us in the studio. Oh, you're very welcome. So speaking of independent films, for this week's In Focus, I wanted to chat a little bit about uh, another film that will be having uh, had its world premiere at the Berlin International Film Festival. The film is Night Flight. It's by the filmmaker Lee Song Hil. Uh, now, this is his third time to visit Ber- the Berlinale, the first time being with uh, his film uh, No Regrets from 2006. And he also uh, was at the festival, the German festival, last year with his film White Night. Uh, Lee Song Hil is um, well known in Korean film circles, probably as the most uh, well respected uh, queer filmmaker in Korea. Uh, of course, being a queer filmmaker in the Korean film industry, is uh, is no small task. Um, now, uh, Night Flight is once again another queer film, but um, whereas the other ones focus predominantly on uh, queer themes, Night Flight has a much broader spoke, um, broader scope. Sorry, it's um, it's set in a high school, and uh, while there is a, a queer element, it goes on, it takes on a lot of. Uh, uh, takes on a lot of social themes. Um, the night flight of the title is actually um, uh, an, an old rundown uh, gay bar that is no longer in operation. It's in it's in a part of town that's being that's being kind of demolished, and some of the, the high school students kind of congregate around there. These kind of uh, these these fringe characters, and so we, we see them uh, in a very literal sense being being kind of uh, being put on the fringe of society, and uh, they're just being they're just being erased almost. Um, it's a very ambitious epic film. It's uh, longer than his other ones. It, this one does go over two hours, so it certainly sustains that length. And um, I'm very excited to see uh, its reception in Berlin. And uh, I think this is kind of a big step up for Lee Song Hil, a work a director whose work I've, I've, I really admire already. So I think this kind of is, he's kind of stepped up his game here, made a more ambitious feature with uh, much larger themes. And uh, I hope it's uh, I hope it's uh, is seen by more people uh, over the course of the year. So that's it for this episode of Korean Cinema Today. We had another great chat with uh, Darcy Packett. It's always a very great pleasure to have him on. Um, Please be sure to tune in again to Korean Cinema Today by finding us on iTunes or on our website, which is once again koreanfilm.or.kr. I hope you've enjoyed this discussion. Thank you very much, and please tune in again next time.